Welcome to the fourth and last of Tanfield's short series of webinars dealing with matters commonly found in cases involving contested probate and disputes arising in the administration of estates. I'm Charles Joseph and I'm joined by Adrian Carr, Gwyn Evans and Olivia Murphy. This webinar deals with issues arising in connection with applications made under the Inheritance Provision for Family and Dependents Act of 1975. Our first speaker will be Gwyn, who's going to set out who is entitled to make an application under the Act. Gwyn, over to you. Thank you, Charles. Just moving the slide on. Um, where the application of the terms of a will or the law relating to intestacy or the combination of the two do not make reasonable financial provision for a person who is entitled to apply under the Act, the court may order that the estate makes provision for the applicant. And the court has wide powers under Section 2 of the 1975 Act regarding the type of provision that it can order. And the classes of people that are entitled to apply are, moving the slide on, um, a spouse or civil partner of the deceased, a former spouse or former civil partner of the deceased, but not one who has formed a subsequent marriage or civil partnership. Any person who doesn't fall into the above categories, who if the deceased died on or after the 1st of January 1996, during the whole of the period of two years ending immediately before the date when the deceased died, was living in the same household as the deceased and living as husband or wife or civil partner of the deceased. Um, the next category, a child, uh, including an adult child of the deceased, and there's been a lot of uh, case law developed from the um, claims brought by adult children. Um, now, it's interesting that um, in the case of Ree Collins in 1990, um, a 19-year-old and a 10-year-old uh, uh, children of the deceased uh, both brought claims the official solicitor became involved and the 10 year old was uh, not permitted to claim um, due to what, what was then Section 39.2 of the Adoption Act 1976 was the, the relative statute, uh, the relevant statute applying. That said, an adopted child shall, subject to subsection 3, which didn't concern them, be treated in law as if he was not the child of any person other than the adopters or adopter. So what had happened in this case was that the um, deceased uh, had not finalised her divorce, uh, sorry, the surviving spouse had not, had not finalised her divorce with the deceased. She died in testet and her estate would have been left to her ex-husband or soon to be ex-husband. Um, and the children got wind of this and they brought claims. And the, um, the son, the 10 year old, was in fact uh, held not entitled to make a claim because um, he had a mere hope of a claim against his birth uh, mother, uh, father, not an interest expectant, which is the word in the statute. Now, the position may have changed for births after the 1st of October 2014 as a result of Section 4 of the Inheritance and Trustees Power Powers Act 2014, which has, uh, according to some commentators, plugged the gap. However, I do note that the authors of Horsbury's Laws uh, of Theobald on Wills and um, uh, West Law uh, all comment that Ree Collins uh, is still good law. So um, you might want to take some bespoke advice if that issue arises, uh, if someone approaches you in those circumstances. Um, the next category on the list is any person not being a child of the deceased, but who is treated. Uh, um, as a child of the uh, deceased. Um, and a ch um, any person not being a child of the deceased, treated as a child of any marriage or civil partnership of the deceased, or treated as a child of any family in which the deceased at any time stood in the role of a parent. And finally, any person who doesn't fit into any of the above categories who immediately before the death of the deceased was being maintained either wholly or partly by the deceased. Um, 
I will move on to reasonable financial provision. And to do that, I will hand over to my colleague, Adrian Carr. Adrian. Thank you very much, Gwyn. Um, when one is considering the question of reasonable financial provision, you have to bear in mind that the court has no jurisdiction under the Act to redistribute the deceased estate according to either what it considers the deceased ought to have done or what it considers to be fair. The court's powers under the Act are restricting to awarded, restricted to awarding reasonable financial provision from the deceased estate for the maintenance of the applicant. Now, I'm just going to look at the question of reasonable financial provision and uh, Gwyn will be examining in a moment the meaning of maintenance. Now, reasonable financial provision depends on the identity of the applicant. Um, reasonable financial provision for spouses and civil partners is different to other classes of applicant. In the case of spouses and civil partners, where there's no continuing separation and no judicial separation or separation order in force at the date of death, reasonable financial provision is such financial provision as it would be reasonable in all the circumstances of the case for the spouse or civil partner to receive, whether or not that provision is required for his or her maintenance. In the case of any other applicant, financial provision is such as would be reasonable in all the circumstances of the case for the applicant to receive for their maintenance. And as I said a moment ago, Gwyn will be considering the meaning of maintenance later in this webinar. Now I'm going to hand over to Charles, who's going to look at the factors the court will take into account when determining an application under the Act. Thank you. Um, so what uh, what informs the court's determination of uh, a 1975 Act application? Uh, in deciding uh, whether reasonable financial provision has been made by will or, or by the law relating to intestacy, the court must have regard to all the seven factors listed in section 3.1 of the Act. The first of those is the financial um, are the financial resources and financial needs which the applicant has or is likely to have in the foreseeable future. And then second and third, the financial resources and financial, re financial needs which any other applicant may have and any beneficiary. Uh, and again, that's financial resources and financial needs which they have or are likely to have in the foreseeable future. Now, obviously, this category is very broad. In many cases, uh, in any case, it could include um, things like an anticipated inheritance, the sale of a company or its shares, the sale of property, the receipt of the proceeds of a pension or a life policy, the receipt of a damages award, um, share dividends in the future, anything at all. Uh, the fourth consideration uh, are any obligations and responsibilities which the deceased had towards any applicant or any beneficiary. That is to say, any applicant or any beneficiary, not just whoever's making an application. Uh, the size and nature of the net estate of the deceased. Any physical or mental disability of any applicant or any beneficiary. This might, of course, overlap with D above because, uh, for example, it may be that the deceased had a disabled child. In that case, he would also have had obligations and responsibilities to that child within the meaning of, section, of subsection D, just as it's to be considered under subsection F. Lastly, uh, the court must have regard to any other matters, including the conduct of the applicant or any other person which in the circumstances of the case, the court may consider relevant. In the sort of cases that we're looking at, 
one of the things that sometimes crops up is estrangement between the deceased and a child of the deceased or a spouse and the circumstances surrounding that is estrangement. So, for example, the court will need to know when, how and why did that estrangement take place? Who, if anyone, has made efforts to end it and what efforts were made and when and so on. Uh, shortly, Olivia will deal with the other con additional considerations for the court in respect of certain specific types of applicant, but I should first mention the relevant date for the assessment of the factors in section three. In considering them, the court must take into account the facts which are known to the court at the date of the hearing. So um, section three, five deals with that. Eilot and Blue Cross deals with that. Uh, therefore, it's essential to um, ensure that all the evidence is up to date at the trial. It's no good doing this on the basis of witness statements that might be a year out of date. Uh, now I hand over to Olivia. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. I'm, I'm going to talk for a moment about the additional discretionary factors which are set out in Section 3, which depend upon what type of applicant is making the application. Uh, the first, of course, is spouse or civil partner. Now, when the applicant is a spouse or a civil partner, the court must also have regard to the age of the applicant and duration of the marriage or civil partnership, the contribution made by the applicant to the welfare of the family of the deceased, including looking after the home or caring for the family, and, and this is uh, unique to the spouse or civil partner, of course, the provision the applicant might reasonably have expected to receive had the marriage uh, been terminated by divorce. Uh, the important thing to note about that is this is neither an upper nor a lower limit. Uh, do not approach these uh, claims on the basis of the simply the Matrimonial Causes Act, Section 25 factors. Um, the award that would be given to a claimant uh, under a divorce is only one of the factors that the court is considering in a 1975 Act claim. Those listening with financial remedy experience might have noticed that the other factors, age of the applicant and duration of the marriage, are also Section 25 Matrimonial Causes Act factors. Uh, but do not presume that there is direct equivalence. For instance, the approach of a court on the length of the marriage is not identical. Uh, consider the Court of Appeal decision in the 2006 case of Cunliffe and Fielden, where the applicant's marriage was of one year and one month's duration. In that case, Lord Justice Wall acknowledged that the brevity of the marriage was an important factor, but he also said uh, that the fact that the marriage had been prematurely terminated by death after a short period uh, may therefore render the length of the marriage a less critical factor than it would have been in the case of a divorce. Um, it is not, of course, uh, the widow's fault that the marriage has been ended by death prematurely. Uh, another reason, of course, why the likely award is not determined merely by reference to the likely financial remedies award is the obvious difference that in a divorce, there are the needs of two persons for the court to consider. And in an Inheritance Act application, there is only the one party to the marriage whose needs are relevant. And this is particularly pertinent in small estate cases. Um, I would also draw to your attention that um, whilst financial remedies law uh, does not bind 1975 Act claims, um, the impact of the Supreme Court decision uh, in Miller and McFarlane uh, has impacted upon decisions in Inheritance Act cases. Uh, for instance, in the Court of Appeal's decision in 1997 of Re Krubert, uh, the Court of Appeal allowed, uh, uh, allowed an appeal against a first instance decision where a recorder transferred uh, to a widow after a marriage of 44 years uh, the matrimonial home, and it substituted instead the award of a life interest in that matrimonial home. 
And if you flash forward to the Court of Appeal's decision in 2012 in a case called Iqbal and Ahmed, the Court of Appeal upheld a first instance decision where a widow was awarded a life interest and a 50% beneficial interest in the matrimonial home. And the Court of Appeal quoted with approval the words of Lord Nichols from Miller and McFarlane when he said that the party's matrimonial home, even if this was brought into the marriage at the outset of one of the parties, uh, usually has a central place in any marriage. And it continued uh, to say that whether or not this dicta constitutes a proposition of law does not matter. Uh, it is on any view of powerful persuasive force. Now, uh, the next class of applicant is a cohabitee. Now, where the application is made by a cohabitee of more than two years, the court must also have regard to the age of the applicant and the length of the period during which the applicant lived as the husband or wife or civil partner of the deceased and in the same household as the deceased. The length of cohabitation can materially affect the maintenance which a cohabitee might expect to be awarded. Uh, for instance, in the 2018 case of Thompson and Raggett and others, uh, the cohabitation was 42 years. And, and when the court was considering whether the 79 year old applicants uh, housing needs could be met by way of a life interest in the home she had shared with the deceased, um, or whether by an outright transfer, the length of the cohabitation was a factor weighing in favour of the outright transfer of the home. And uh, additionally, where the applicant is a cohabitee, the court will also have regard to the contribution made by the applicant to the welfare of the family of the deceased, including looking after the home and caring for the family. Uh, moving on to the next slide, please. Um, where the applicant is a child, and that includes adult child, or a person treated as a child of the family by the deceased, the court must have regard to the manner in which the applicant was expected to be educated or trained. Um, and where the applicant is not the child of the deceased, but is in the category of a child treated as a child of the family by the deceased, the court must also have regard to whether the deceased maintains the applicant and if so for how long and upon what basis and to what extent, whether and to what extent the deceased assumed responsibility for the maintenance of the applicant and in either of the above scenarios whether the deceased did so knowing that the applicant was not in fact their own child. Uh, the court will also take into account uh, in that category the liability of any other person to maintain the applicant. Uh, when the applicant is a person being maintained wholly or in part by the deceased, the court must regard to have regard to the following additional factors, the duration of the maintenance, its basis and its extent, and whether and if so to what extent the deceased assumed responsibility for the maintenance of the applicant. Gwyn. Thank you, Olivia. So, as Adrian said, I'm going to look at what is uh, what qualifies as maintenance. <clears throat> now, this was reviewed by the Supreme Court in the decision in Erlert recently, and uh, it reviewed the authorities and distilled various principles from them. <clears throat> First of all, maintenance is not limited to subsistence, and so it is not just basic needs. Um, however, it must not confer any capital on the claimant. So it's about ongoing income needs. And maintenance cannot extend to any or everything which it would be desirable for the claimant to have. It must import provision to meet the everyday expenses of living. That's from Ila to paragraph 14. And the paying off of a mortgage by a married adult son living with his family in comfortable circumstances was firmly rejected as maintenance. That's in Re Jennings' deceased in 1994. Uh, a lump sum from which both income and capital can be drawn over the years, for example, on the Duxbury model, which is familiar to many family practitioners. That's the case of Duxbury and Duxbury Note 1992. Um, that will often be more appropriate. And that's cheaper and uh, convenient. And the courts are used to making those kinds of uh, awards on that, that sort of structure. Um, maintenance can, however, be provided by way of a lump sum. And that could be, for example, to buy a house in which the applicant can be housed 
thereby relieving the applicant pro tanto of income expenditure. Uh, and Lord uh, Ms. Um, Brown Wilkinson, Mr. Justice Brown Wilkinson, as he then was in Reed Dennis deceased, um, made that observation. Um, <clears throat> Maintenance um, provision of housing will normally, however, be by way of a life interest. Um, and Lady Hale added in Illert that it's difficult to reconcile the grant of an absolute interest in real property with the concept of reasonable provision for maintenance, buying the house and settling it upon the claimant for life with a reversion to the estate would be more compatible with that. So you're looking at a, a settlement or a life interest in property if you are uh, uh, looking for housing as an aspect of the maintenance claim. Now, what about debts? Um, I've just gone on one slide too far, haven't I? Uh, debts. <clears throat> payment of existing debts may be appropriate as a maintenance payment. For example, if that pays the debts of an applicant in order to enable him to continue to carry on a profit making business or profession, and that may well be construed as maintenance. And that's also from uh, Inri Dennis, deceased. Um, a capital sum to meet capital transfer tax on a sizable gift made to the claimant by the deceased is not maintenance. Uh, once again, Inri Dennis has affirmed in Illet. Um, maintenance certainly covers food and fuel. It covers essential white goods, basic carpeting, floor, floor coverings and curtains, and the replacement of worn out and broken beds. Um, Mrs Illett herself, in fact, made a strong case for items which she needed to make her household function properly. And similar necessities such as a reliable car or provision for a holiday could be included too. But repairs to the structure of a house are not to be uh, included as falling within the definition of maintenance. So the courts have given some ideas of what maintenance can and can't involve and that uh, gives some guidance to practitioners for how they structure their claims. Now, at this stage, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Adrian. Thank you very much, Gwyn. Now, I'm just going to consider very briefly the time limit for bringing an application under the Act. In short, by Section 4 of the Act, an application shall not, except with the permission of the court, be made after the end of the period of six months from the date on which representation with respect to the estate of the deceased is first taken out. So in other words, uh, as soon as a grant of probate or administration is uh, taken out, the six month time limit starts to run. It's important to note that the six month time limit is set by statute uh, and if at all possible, you shouldn't miss it. But if it is missed, and it quite often is, the court can grant permission to bring an application out of time. And so I'll now just briefly consider the circumstances which the court will consider when confronted by such an application. As you'll see from the slide, there are in essence three relatively recent uh, Court of Appeal decisions in which this has been considered. The first was uh, Berger and Berger, in 2014. And in that decision, Lady Justice Black approved a number of guidelines which had been formulated by the judge at first instance in that case, um, derived from previous authorities. And those are very briefly uh, as follows. The court's discretion is unfettered, but must be exercised judicially in accordance with what is right and proper. Second, the onus is on the applicant to show sufficient grounds for, grant, for the granting of permission to apply out of time. Third, the court must consider whether the applicant has acted promptly and the circumstances in which he applied for an extension of time after the expiry of the time limit. Fourth, the court should look at whether negotiations were begun within the time limit. Next, whether the estate has been distributed before the claim was notified to the defendants. Thirdly, whether dismissal of the claim leaves the applicant without recourse to other remedies. And finally, whether looking at the position as it is now, that is at the date of the hearing, uh, 
whether the applicant has an arguable case under the Inheritance Act if it were allowed to proceed. Since Berger and Berger, there have been two decisions in the Court of Appeal on applications under Section 4 for permission to bring a claim out of time. Both of those were in 2019. Firstly, Cowan and Foreman, and secondly, Begum and Ahmed. Dealing with those cases in date order, in Cowan and Foreman, which was uh, a decision from July 2019, uh, at first instance, Mr Justice Mostyn had not upheld the party's standstill agreement uh, moratorium, which had been agreed uh, prior to the expiry of the time limit, and had dismissed the, the claim, encouraging the parties in future to, to issue and then apply for a stay. But the Court of Appeal disagreed and the Court of Appeal said that the Section 4 time limit was not designed to protect the court from stale claims, but to avoid unnecessary delay in the administration of estates. It said that granting permission to apply out of time under Section 4 did not require the court to adopt a robust disciplinary approach in common with the enforcement of the rules under the CPR. And the commencement of negotiations within the time limit will be borne in mind. The Court of Appeal said it would be unlikely that a court would refuse to extend time if negotiations had failed, but both parties had had lawyers. So following Cowan and Foreman, parties to Inheritance Act disputes should bear in mind that it, it may well be appropriate to give due weight to negotiations which take place after the six month deadline. And um, Lord Justice King said that there should be a clear written agreement setting out the terms and duration of an agreement and each of the potential parties should be included and that this would form the basis of any future application to court by consent for permission to issue out of time. But of course, the final decision always rests with the court. Then there was Begum and Ahmed in October 2019. And just briefly on the facts of this case, the deceased had died in 2015. His only asset was the house where the appellant uh, that was the applicant had lived since 1993. She was aged 60 and was disabled and was the deceased's wife. In his will, the deceased has, had appointed his daughter as his sole executrix and had left his entire estate to her. Probate was granted to her in April 2016. And in June 2016, the executrix daughter demanded possession of the house from the, the applicant mother. That month, the applicant solicitors wrote back, referring her entitlement to financial provision, referring to her entitlement to financial provision under the Inheritance Act and to challenge the validity of the will on testamentary capacity grounds. Then, between July and December 2016, the mother was unrepresented by lawyers. The six month time limit for bringing an action under Section 2 expired in October 2016. <clears throat> the executrix daughter issued possession proceedings in November 2016. In April 2017, that is five months after the possession proceedings were issued, the mother issued a defence on defence to the possession claim, alleging that the will was invalid, but not making a claim under the Act. And it was only in February 2018, which was a year and four months after the expiry of the time limit under Section 4, that the mother brought a claim under the Act and applied for permission to bring it out of time. At first instance, the judge held that the claim had substantial merit and that the mother would be rendered homeless were the house to be sold, but noted that the only reason for the property not being sold was her defence to the possession claim. Having regards to the procedural failings by the mother's solicitors, the judge held that there was no reasonable explanation for the delay in bringing the claim and refused permission. 
So the mother appealed to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal allowed her appeal. The Court of Appeal approved the uh, criteria set out in Berger and went on to say that the discretion afforded to the court by Section 4 had to be exercised in accordance with its statutory purpose and context. It said that it was material to ask whether bringing the claim out of time would cause delay in the proper administration of the estate or have the potential to interfere with the distributions which had already made. Of course, in this case, where the sole asset of the estate was the property, um, the, the late making of the application didn't affect the proper administration of the estate at all. Court of Appeal went on to say it was relevant to consider whether any clear prejudice to the party seeking the extension if leave was with, withheld would, would arise and also conversely whether there'd be prejudice to the other party if leave was granted. The court said that the purposes behind the section 4 discretion to allow permission to bring an application out of time and the CPR the jurisdiction under the civil procedure rules meant that it was wrong to draw on civil procedure rules cases to inform the exercise of the discretion under section 4. It said that an extension would not be granted where the applicant had no real prospect of success on the merits of the claim but it went on to say that how much further the merits could be taken into account depended on how clearly the facts emerged at the stage at which the discretion was being exercised, in other words, at the application hearing. It said that where the claim would dis turn on disputed issues of fact, which could not be resolved without a trial, the court should not conduct a mini trial at the interim stage. But said that where the court could form a clear view on the merits based on undisputed facts, it was right to reflect that view in deciding whether to extend the time to bring the application. Um, and finally, I just note on, on the extension of time, in January 2020, in a case called Re Busati, the High Court upheld a decision of Chief Master Marsh that a widow was entitled to permission to make a claim against her late husband's estate under the Act some 25 years and nine months after the expiration of the six month time limit. I just point out that um, since o October 2014, um, prior to which no claim could be made until a grant of probate had been uh, taken out. Since then, since October 2014, an application under the Act may be made before the grant of representation of the estate is taken out. Now, I will pass over to Olivia who's going to consider interim orders under the Act. Thank you. Uh, the court may make an order for interim relief under Section 5 of the Inheritance Act. Um, section 5, subsection 1 uh, provides A, if it appears to the court that the applicant is in immediate need of financial assistance, but it is not yet possible to determine what order, if any, should be made under Section 2, and B, that property forming part of the net estate of the deceased is or can be made available to meet that need, the court can make an order for an interim award. Now, that interim relief can be um, awarded for interim maintenance needs, if there is an immediate need for that, uh, but one immediate need uh, might be to fund the legal proceedings that are ongoing and the court can make one or more interim awards and it can impose conditions and restrictions on the interim award where it is making an interim award to fund costs uh, for proceedings if it finds so reasonable to do. Uh, the matters which the court is to have regard in considering the ap an application for interim awards are all the matters in section 3. Uh, which my colleagues have of course and in particular Charles has gone through. Um, whilst the wording uh, does say that the payment is made before it is possible to determine what order if any should be made, the uh, prospects of success of the claim are of course a relevant factor. In 
at T against V, W, X, Y and Z in 2019, uh, Mrs Justice Leaven dismissed an application for an interim lump sum for legal funding and ordered the applicant to pay the beneficiary's costs of that application. Uh, the facts of that case were these. The applicant had been in a relationship with the deceased, but she was not able to bring a claim uh, as a cohabitant. So she was bringing a claim uh, as, a, as a person who was maintained by the deceased um, before he died. And, and that claim was disputed. It was disputed that she was, in fact, uh, maintained by the deceased. And therefore, of course, it was not clear until that was determined that she would receive anything as a result of the proceedings. Mrs Justice Leaven noted that uh, the nature of an order under Section 5 is very draconian, being a mandatory order to pay money which the claimant may ultimately be found not to be entitled to, and where there is no possibility of a cross undertaking in damages uh, that presents certain difficulties uh, for the defendants. Uh, she found that the circumstances of Article 1 of the Protocol 1 of the European Convention on Human Rights was further engaged. Uh, she said, given the very nature of such an interim order, considerable caution must be applied. This cautious approach can be analysed under Article 1, Protocol 1 of the European Convention of Human Rights and the requirement for proportionality in a decision to effectively deprive someone of property after an interlocutory hearing, but almost certainly with a permanent effect, um, I therefore consider the cautious approach which I should involve, adopt involves ensuring that any order that I make is proportionate. So if you are going to make an application within proceedings, two requirements must be met. Firstly, the claimant must be in immediate need of financial assistance. And secondly, there must be a consideration of whether or not the claimant's substantive claim had sufficient merit to justify an interim order. Uh, and that is uh, what Mrs Justin Leibn considered required the claimant to demonstrate a strong, arguable case. Uh, in order to satisfy the court that there is an immediate need, uh, certain sorts of evidence will uh, be required. Um, there is a, a trend towards permitting legal costs to be recovered and one of the cases that has been used by practitioners making applications under the Inheritance Act for guidance is the 2014 case of Reuben and Reuben. Um, now Reuben and Reuben is a financial remedies case and it is particularly a case about the award of interim costs under the Matrimonial Causes Act which specifically um, provides for such an award to be made. Um, but Considering the, work, the, the types of evidence that Reuben and Reuben suggests is necessary uh, will assist someone preparing an application under Section 5 of the Inheritance Act. Uh, for instance, in order to satisfy a court that there's an immediate need, include evidence as to whether or not a legal team will act on a, a CFA or whether or not a litigation loan can be obtained. Um, Mrs Justice Leaven was referred to Reuben and Reuben when she was considering uh, T against V, W, X, Y and Z uh, and the applicability uh, of that case to the application was not disputed. Um, significantly, she also said it would be inappropriate to apply the very strict requirements of, of Rule CPR, Rule 25.6 regarding interim payments. Uh, but she said that one has to be cautious and the court must be conscious of the requirement for proportionality in a decision to effectively deprive someone of property after an interlocutory hearing. So that is uh, interim uh, relief for the provision of legal costs. As for costs generally, these are dealt with by CPR 44.2 uh, uh, little 2 and little a, i.e. the normal civil rules. Do not assume that all parties' costs will just come out of the estate because that assumption would be wrong. Uh, and I'm now going to hang hand over to uh, Charles for some closing words. Thank you, Olivia. Um, thank you, everyone, for viewing and listening to this webinar, which was the fourth and final webinar in our series. We hope that you've found them all to be useful and productive. Feedback is always welcome, and if you have any, hopefully constructive comments, then please give them to our Chamber's marketing manager at the email address 
events at tanfieldchambers.co.uk. Thank you once again. This webinar is now concluded. <laughs>